talk is going to be a sprint through Edgar Degas and the life and times. Uh, it's, uh, um, I think you're getting perspectives from other people as well. So each of us has our own, uh, Lisa, hers, and mine, and, um, and then uh, Dr. Werness um, later this afternoon. Yeah, tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow, Sunday. Tomorrow, tomorrow. Yeah, two o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, so moving right along. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, what we'll talk about here then, Edgar Degas, The Man and the Times, uh, because the Times had a dramatic impact on his imagery, as a matter of fact. Uh, so I'm also going to show you examples of what he was painting at the same time he was making the works on paper uh, in our own show. So you'll get a feel for what he was doing publicly, and in our case, what he was doing privately. Uh, is since our show really is all about the, the private images. Um, here you can see Degas, both self-portraits. Uh, one uh, as a young man, of course, and the other uh, in old age. Uh, he, uh, he lived until 1917, so it wasn't such old age, but, um, but much later. Um, Degas was born into a wealthy family in 1834, and he lived until 1917. And if you think about it, that was long enough to see the introduction of Cubism uh, and, uh, and other, uh, ar other artistic movements of the time. And the start of World War I, uh, he died one year before the war ended. So his life spanned an exceptional period in history. Uh, as the world was transitioning into the modern world, uh, much as we know it. Um, this is a portrait of Degas' father. It looks kind of imposing. Uh, his family was from Italy, and Degas' mother uh, was an American. She was born in New Orleans uh, and uh, died relatively early in Degas' life. Um, so the title of this talk is Edgar Degas and Modernity. And uh, so what do we mean by modernity, at least in art? Um, what we feel uh, day to day, or often, is a sense of fragmented exhibit, um, a too hurried pace, and a sense of alienation and sometimes being all alone, loneliness. And in response to, uh, this is all in response to rapid advances in technology beginning in the 19th century. Um, and uh, uh, with these changes came a, a dramatic rise in the middle class and an equally dramatic rise in the number of women uh, venturing out of doors and into the workforce. So there were three specific uh, technological advances that had an impact uh, on how Degas saw the world. And no invention uh, of the 1800s is, is more important than the, in, uh, than the invention of the steam locomotive and the railroad. Uh, artists of the day uh, celebrated it, as in this painting here by Claude Monet. Uh, for Degas, its impact was the motion it represented. We had never seen anything, uh, seen anything move that quickly before. <laughs> by the way, there's a book out, A River of Shadows. I don't know if any of you have seen it. But um, the author explores the impact of an increased emotion and what um, what uh, uh, was meant for everybody in, in adapting to it. And she describes in the very early days of the train, I, a train moving somewhere between 30 and 40 miles an hour, and the man standing on the track couldn't perceive something was moving so fast. And in the time, he had plenty of time to get off by our perspective, uh, but he was actually killed by the train. So it's a very complex and sort of interesting environment. Um, in any case, the second uh, revolutionary technology having a significant, a significant impact on uh, Degas was the camera. Uh, the camera has its own way of seeing, and it's a way of seeing that Degas would emulate. A camera, of course, is tied to a vantage point of the picture taker, and it can only record a relatively narrow field. Uh, cropping sometimes occurs at the edges of the image. And in a particularly significant advance in the 19th century, the camera could also stop motion. Uh, Degas was fascinated by motion, 
and he learned a great deal from the motion studies of the photographer Edwin Rybridge, whose uh, work you can see there. Um, I bet most of you know he was from San Francisco. And the, these photos in particular were commissioned by Leland Stanford to solve burning issues of the day, one of which is whether all four feet of a horse <laughs> were off the ground at the same time when they were trotting. Uh, trotting. And we can see from two and three or so, yes, indeed, they're all off the ground. Um, <laughs> the second burning issue is when they're galloping, do they place their Rear, rear legs forward and their, and their uh, backward and their forward, uh, front legs forward at the same time. And uh, most artists were painting with that as a gallop, uh, including in this early photo, uh, image by Degas. Um, I think in the end the startling point is that the camera could see something we humans couldn't. Uh, and you can imagine that seeing something for the very first time in history was a remarkable advance. Okay, a, th a third technological advantage during Degas' lifetime was the prevalence of gaslighting and later electricity. So for the first time in history, food and entertainment could be enjoyed in the evening. The upper and middle classes mingled in cafes, parks, and theaters uh, for an entirely new societal norm. That mingling hadn't really taken place before. And lighting became part of the narrative in a number of the works by uh, Degas that we'll see in just a second. So he's considered one of the founders of Impressionism. Uh, in its earliest years, the painting to the left represented the type of work uh, being, uh, receiving many official uh, honors, while the painting to the right, uh, which gave Impressionism its name, uh, it's Impression Sunrise by Claude Monet, 1872. Uh, that painting to the right was uh, decidedly rejected. Uh, Degas himself played uh, a key role in organizing Impressionist exhibits, which included his own works. Uh, but he differed from the Impressionists in significant ways. Artists such as Renoir that you see here, uh, his work entitled uh, Gust of Wind, uh, it re reflects painting out of doors, recording the fleeting effects of light and atmosphere, uh, all using a bright color palette. Um, it's almost impossible to feel the wind. Um, it's an amazing picture. Um, Degas, by contrast, what one sees immediately, uh, dark colors in the studio. He approached painting with a, uh, with a great deal of thought, uh, stressing strong composition and drawing. And, and uh, he often, uh, uh, his palette was largely dark, later it got lighter, um, uh, but he concentrated on the figure actually by contrast to the Impressionists who favored landscapes. Uh, but what he shared in common with the Impressionists was their interest in modern life. Actually, let me go back to there. Um, he, uh, and of course we've mentioned he's fascinated by movement, and so what we see is that he found discipline movement in subjects such as horse racing and ballet, and repetitive movement uh, in the everyday tasks of washerwomen, dressmakers, milliners, and, and others. Um, but Degas dealt uh, more deeply than most artists of the day, uh, capturing the uncertainty of the, of the shifting world and the motion that he saw around him. Uh, believe it or not, this is a painting by Degas. Uh, it was one of his very earliest works. It's academic in nature, much uh, trying to please the official art establishment. Uh, it's titled Alexander and Bucephalus, and of course it's about Alexander the Great. Now, at the very same time he made this painting, uh, he was making studies of classical subjects such as these in order to hone his drawing skills. Uh, and it's behind the scenes works that we see in our exhibit and these, uh, these are included in it. 